Hi, Barbara Heidenreich here from Barbara's Force Free Animal Training with a very special presentation. I presented this paper at two professional animal training conferences earlier this year, and the paper was well received. It generated a lot of discussion, but it also got some pushback. Now, I kind of expected that because the topic can be a bit controversial, and I'm also asking people to sort of break with some of their traditional training practices, especially when it comes to the bird show world. But what I didn't expect was for someone to misrepresent my position and misquote me in a publication for a professional animal training organization. Now because of this I've decided it's really important for you to see exactly what my position is. So I've prepared this presentation so that you can see for yourself what the content of the presentation was and hopefully it will give you some food for thought, help you think about ways that we might improve welfare for the birds that we work with, especially ones in bird shows, and um, most of all get you thinking. So I hope you enjoy the presentation and if you have any questions feel free to contact me. The title of this paper is Weight Management in Animal Training, Pitfalls, Ethical Considerations, and Alternative Options. First of all, I wanted to explain my background in animal training. I started out in free flight of bird shows, which is an area of training that typically does use weight management to create motivation for food in flying birds. So using weight management was something that I've been taught to do. Um, I used it for many, many years. And it wasn't until about 12 years ago when I started uh, working as an animal training consultant, working with different facilities, and working with multiple species that I found myself moving away from weight management. In fact, many times I found myself questioning if I even wanted to use it. And it, it became a problem for me that I, I found myself feeling uncomfortable about the process. And because of this feeling, I felt it was important for me to explore why was I having an issue with this practice that I've been using many years in the past. And it really led to some really inter interesting exploration and, of course, to this paper here. So hopefully what I share with you in this presentation will give you some food for thought and help you understand why I went down the path of exploring other options for creating motivation in the animals that we train. I would like to say that change is scary and I recognize that for a lot of people that introducing and challenging um, some topics that most of us are very familiar with can be really frightening. It, it makes it appear as if we're doing something bad or or um, judging the kind of training that you're doing, but really for me what this is about is trying to continue to move our industry forward and make progress and make sure that we're really paying attention to the animals and trying to provide the best welfare. So I realize that for some people this will be a scary topic, but I hope you will listen with open ears and an open mind because it's really about trying to move our industry forward and, and make some progress. So to get started, the first thing we need to do is define weight management. Now for some animal trainers, this is a new concept because perhaps you work primarily with um, mammals or perhaps you're uh, not in a setting that would consider this. So typically weight management is a practice that is used in bird shows. It's also used in laboratory settings for some mammals as well as birds to create motivation for food. And what happens with weight management is that a weight range is identified for a particular animal that seems to create a behavioral response towards food that is a level of motivation that works for your training goals. Ideally, the practice is to keep the animal at the highest weight possible, yet still get a response for food in training sessions or presentations. There's a lot of factors that influence this, so it's it probably more to go into than we have time for, but in general, the idea is that you're going to end up sort of micromanaging a specific amount of food that the animal's going to get that will keep it in a certain weight range and that will help promote motivation for food reinforcers. Certainly factors like weather might cause you to increase the diet, more exercise, things like that, that would cause the animal to put on weight would cause you to increase the diet. So all those factors need to be taken into consideration to do it in a manner that is considered best practices. But why question this practice? Because it does seem to work and people um, have been successful using it for, for many years. Well, what happened for me is I started asking myself, 
What does weight have to do with motivation? What does that number on the scale have to do with an animal's level of interest in food? Because in reality, even our own weights change frequently, but we don't typically think about what we weigh on the scale to find out whether we're hungry or not. We're going off of our feeling. You know, certainly when we are feeling uncomfortable about food, we might be more anxious for food. Maybe there's a preferred food item we really like and we might be more motivated for that even though we've had a great big meal. The, the reality is the number on the scale just doesn't really correlate, in my opinion, to motivation for food. There's a whole, other, a whole bunch of other factors involved. Other things that came up for me is that other animals are not trained using weight management. So if you go to a marine mammal show, we don't weigh a dolphin every day before it gets trained. Same with other species of animals. Certainly many professionals have worked with many different species from domestics to exotic animals where we never put the animal on a scale to determine whether we're going to have a training session or not. So it really kind of struck me as odd is that why do we only do this with birds, in the, at least in the bird show world? The other thing that kept coming to mind is that gaining weight doesn't mean you're not hungry. Certainly many of us have experienced ourselves when we are overweight yet still hungry or an animal that's significantly overweight but is still hungry. So once again sort of illustrating that the number on the scale doesn't correlate to your level of motivation for food. That connection really didn't make sense for me any longer. So we have the data that other animals do train just fine without weight management and the reality is we also have the data that birds can train very well without weight management. So we have to ask ourselves is this strategy needed and is it even in the best interest of the animals that we train? So here's just a little video clip to show you an animal species being trained without weight management who certainly responds quite well to food as a reinforcer. So this is an Amur leopard trained to present its hip for an injection, and this is an, getting an injection of saline. So another question that came to mind as I started to explore this topic more is hunger and motivation. They really aren't exactly the same thing. We tend to use the words interchangeably, but they're not the same. Hunger is unfortunately not very well defined in the scientific literature. It is considered a negative subjective state, basically something that the animal wants relief from. They don't want to feel hungry is what the results are telling us. We can measure it metabolically, which is challenging of course, because that means doing things like blood draws, but most of the time what we're trying to do is measure it behaviorally, like vigor of response, or um, how quickly an animal responds or how frequently. But motivation is different. Animals are motivated to present behaviors for lots of different reasons, not just for food reinforcers. There's plenty of non-food reinforcers that have a lot of value to animals and will cause them to present behavior. We also see that animals will perform behavior vigorously using some of our different strategies that are available in behavior analysis. So for example, using an extinction procedure will cause an animal to really go for it when it comes to presenting a behavior because in the past that behavior's earned reinforcement so if they present it even more vigorously perhaps that will result in reinforcers. Same for using different schedules of reinforcement. So one strategy very rarely used in bird shows is to ask for numerous presentations of behaviors or unpredictable occurrences of behavior before a reinforcer is going to be delivered. That strategy can also increase motivation. Animals will present a behavior many times hoping for that opportunity to get reinforced. And here's a video example of a bower bird that was willing to present behavior for the opportunity to access a bit of blue paper to put in its bower. Just a little illustration that the motivation behind behaviors isn't always about food and we can take advantage of that in our animal training. So some other things about motivation, we certainly observe in humans that humans will present food acquisition behavior in the absence of hunger. We certainly see that when there's preferred food items around, maybe you just had a full meal, but oh, there's creme brulee for dessert, and you're still willing to eat that. Animals, of course, also present behavior even in the absence of perceived hunger, or at least what we can see as hunger. So certainly animals that cache, think about uh, this little hamster here, or crows and ravens that typically will take food and cache in their familiar environments. So that's actually something that some trainers have used to take uh, as way to 
keep an animal in that location is providing a caching location near the stage area or the area where the animal is going to perform. So for me, this distinction between hunger and motivation is super important because it allows trainers to have other options for acquiring behavior that isn't so reliant upon having an animal hungry or very concerned about food. Another part of this topic that I think is really worth exploring is how do we measure hunger? It isn't practical for us to do metabolic measures. We can look at behavioral measures, like how quickly the animal eats. Do they do other behaviors that simulate feeding behaviors when they don't have food in front of them, sort of being obsessed about food acquisition? You know, are their activity levels low or high? There are certainly species-specific indicators, like when we're looking at bird behavior, we typically look for, does the bird wipe its beak on the perch? Usually that's an indicator that it's starting to slow down or that the food was a little bit messy. We'll also see birds sometimes salivate a little or kind of move their beaks prior to eating if they're a little bit interested in food or lean towards the food or look towards the food. All those things are tidbits of information that let us know how uh, motivated for food an animal might be. We can also measure it operantly, so we can look at the force of the response, if the animal's uh, latent in its response, if it's uh, um, presenting the behavior frequently. Those things can also be measured to let us know the level of motivation. So for me, what I'm encouraging people to think about is instead of focusing on the scale, since we know the scale can not really be accurate because of so many factors, you know, the fact of the animal may be overweight but it's still hungry, all those things, that really what we should be focusing on much more is the behavioral response. Now a lot of trainers do focus on that or talk about focusing on it, but they still tend to keep their eyes on the scale. And I'd highly encourage people to think about these other ways to measure motivation. And hopefully I'll have resources for you to help you do that down the road. This video clip is of a mink that we worked with at a wildlife rehabilitation facility and we found a way to create motivation by using a few strategies. First we offered as much food as the animal wanted during a training session and that was typically little pieces of mouse and when the animal would start to cache food that we took that as an indicator that he satiated in the moment and maybe we can end our training session there. And We did that a couple times a day and um, fed him till he was satiated a couple times a day and we found that his weight didn't change whatsoever compared to his old feeding strategy. So it didn't affect his weight. Weight wasn't really relevant. What we were looking at was his behavioral response. We also used high value reinforcers. So in this little clip here you'll also see he's getting some raw egg which he really appreciates. So the pitfalls of the scale. So what can happen if you're if you're just a little too focused on the scale is that people think, ah, I've got to keep the animal in this weight range. And because they're all about that weight range, they miss the behavioral cues that indicate the animal is just too motivated for food, too hungry. And another thing that became really obvious for me, traveling around, having the opportunity to see many different animal training presentations, is that people were becoming desensitized to what a hungry animal looks like and instead that was being viewed as normal motivation and I believe that even for me as a professional animal trainer doing bird shows I also experienced that I became desensitized to a hungry animal and I think that's a shame that that becomes the norm instead of whoa that animal's looking a little too hungry for food so another pitfall of all of this is that when people are really focused on the numbers, what happens is we get what some might call poor application of weight management strategies. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But first let me show you this video clip of this particular owl and explain the story here. So with this owl, this particular individual had been receiving an overabundant diet, too much for this animal, and she technically was considered obese at the time. She had also been chased around to step up on the glove, so she had a history of aversives yeah. associated with gloves now. And you'll see in the clip how she, she moves away from the glove, she shows a fear response to the glove. So we did try food, and as you'll see, she has no interest in food in the beginning. And then we did start managing how much food she got and, and micromanaging um, her diet.
But at the end, what I see is an owl that's too motivated for food, one that's always keeping her eyes on where the next tidbit of food is coming from. And even when the trainer steps outside of the enclosure, a situation which would normally cause a bird to look around and, and see its new environment, it's still very focused on food. So for me, that's an indicator that the bird's not getting enough food and needs to have more food offered to it at that time. The results of poor application include frantic or anxious behavior when anticipating food or eating food. I know that's a little bit ambiguous and tough to evaluate, but for me, when I see animals that they can't seem to look at their environment or or pay attention to anything except for where that next bite of food is coming from, that concerns me. That's a red flag. And also the same for those animals that may be in an enclosure and every time a trainer walks by they're very focused on that trainer because it might be an indicator that they're about to get fed. So that for me is also a red flag. We'll also see animals that will gorge water. You'll commonly see this in parrots that have been in weight managed for a period of time. Um, and you'll also see food-related stereotypies. So I've seen cranes that are pecking at the water constantly, chickens pecking at the water constantly. And these food-related stereotypies have also been observed in research settings. They're pretty much something that would be considered an indicator of not getting enough food. If people start weight managing birds in their first year, you'll often see stunted growth. We'll get little tiny Harris hawks, little tiny parrots that shouldn't be that small for the species that they are, but because weight management was started in that first year, they never really develop as they should. What can also happen, especially if weight management happens early on, is persistent presentation of juvenile behaviors. We'll see food begging and head bobbing and big fluffy feathers on parrot heads uh, from birds that are always thinking about food. And unfortunately, that will persist into adulthood for many of these birds. Some other possible issues that have been observed, but we really only see it anecdotally at this stage. We don't have enough data to make conclusive statements. But there may be some issues with feather destructive behavior. We'll see sometimes Harris hawks that once they're put on a weight management program, they'll start feather picking. But then once put back on feed up, their feathers grow back in. Some birds that have had seizures, potentially due to inappropriate diets from lack of quantity and appropriate content, and also bone density issues that result in breakages that would seem really abnormal for a bird of that age or size. Unfortunately, weight management has also found its way to the companion parrot community. So there are people with pet parrots who have resorted to weight management to create motivation. And I think most experienced trainers would agree that weight management is not something to be taken lightly. And it's something that should be learned under the guidance of a very experienced mentor if it is going to be used at all. And in my experience, working with companion parrots especially, it's never really necessary to weight manage parrots. And I also personally believe it's not necessary to weight manage parrots in shows either. Parrots are one of those species that respond to so many different types of reinforcers that we have plenty to work with that weight management is really not necessary to train parrots. And we do have lots of examples of free-flying parrots that are not weight managed that work very well. And I'll give you some of those at the end. So those were examples of what can go wrong if somebody is maybe a little too overzealous on the weight management strategies. Maybe they're not feeding enough food, really micromanaging the diet, and therefore creating all sorts of problems. So the thought process is that if weight management is applied well, what should be happening is that the animal's weight should be pretty high. In fact, maybe higher than what it would be if the bird had food in front of it 24-7. When an animal will work in that condition, it's been considered psychological appetite or psychological hunger. Uh, someone else was calling it the food paradox. The idea is that the animal is responding because there's a perceived food shortage. So at one point in its life, food wasn't always available, so it better, it's learned it should take advantage when food is available. And sort of there's this underlying assumption that the animal's not really hungry and that it's really just responding due to this psychological need to get food because it's not always available. So that's typically been presented as 
a good practice and good welfare. For me, there's some challenges with this concept. First of all, it implies the animal's not experiencing hunger. And that's probably not the case because if an animal goes without food for a certain period of time, it's very likely going to be hungry at some point. So we can't say that the animal's not hungry just because it weighs more. It, and again, we're going back to that assumption that weight and hunger are somehow linearly related, but we know that that's not the case. Again, this seems to suggest good welfare by keeping this animal at this high weight and it's, and it's working and that the motivation is all about this perceived food shortage. But that perceived food shortage also leads to further questions about animal welfare. Is it okay for an animal to be concerned that food may not always be available? So when I started thinking about this concept a bit more, it became clear that this psychological state is very similar to something that's been observed in humans, which has been called food hoarding. Basically what happens is people who are deprived of food, let's say they were a prisoner of war, or they were a child that came from a food insecure area, or someone that was lost in the woods, and they went without food for a period of time, what happens is they become very obsessed with seeking food. So even when these people have full access to food and it's not in shortage anymore, they will still respond with this food hoarding behavior. So this may include binging on and gorging food, even if food is readily available. And again, just this obsession with food. So as I started looking at this in humans, I started thinking about some of the birds we work with and found that to me it seems to be a very similar psychological state that these birds are now obsessed with when are they going to get food and there's a lot of anxiety before time to be fed they certainly gorge when food is available in abundance so you'll see um, birds that get put on feet up after a show or show season and people have to monitor how much they offer because the birds will gorge to the point that they can't properly digest the food and, and eventually might regurgitate the food and we also see that in humans humans will gorge until they're sick even if food is readily available if they've been food deprived for a period of time in their life. So this really presents some welfare issues for me and even though the bird may be at a nice weight I don't know that I'm comfortable with that psychological state and I think it looks different in different birds. So if you've got an animal that's seeking relief from hunger or a perceived food shortage, you get a very different behavioral response than the one who isn't obsessed with food but is willing to work for that desired consequence, whatever it may be, whether it's a food reinforcer or um, tactile or enrichment or companionship, whatever might be the reinforcer for that animal. So here's a little video clip to kind of show you how that looks different and really one of the motivations for why I did this paper. I would often see some birds in a training session or show that looked very obsessed with food, while I'd see others that were clearly working well, but didn't have that anxiety about food. And that's a pretty important distinction in my opinion. Do you like rock and roll? Ah, ah, ah. Do you like country? So something that has been presented as a defense for this psychological hunger or appetite is that it's kind of like nature, that birds don't have food in front of them all the time, so they have to uh, you know, take advantage of the moment when it arises, especially for birds of prey. But the difference is, is that a wild bird has the opportunity to go seek food if it wants to, and certainly birds in bird shows don't, don't have those opportunities. They're either tethered or they're in an enclosure, and seeking food is really on our terms, not theirs. And another thing that's different for wild birds is that there's times in their lives where food may be very abundant, and deprivation is not this chronic thing that's going on year-round in order to create behavior. I will say that birds that fly in falconry-type situations or maybe flown in that kind of style 
yourself for a presentation probably have a greater opportunity to practice some of this food seeking behavior because they're out for longer periods of time their uh, their behaviors are much more loose and unstructured certainly with falconry birds they don't know when a hunting opportunity is available so they're not predicting exactly what's going to happen when so they they may have a little bit more of replicating nature than a typical bird show with a structured pattern and routine so with all this said what are solutions or some options to train birds that don't rely so much on this weight management strategy so one of the things i advocate is using food management now food management is different from weight management food management is talking about manipulating what food items are offered so like for example if you know a bird prefers a certain food item you would let the animal have access to its regular diet all day but then only use the preferred food items for training you might do things like have training sessions several times a day and feed the animal till it was satiated every training session like was mentioned with the mink you might try when you start your training session you work with the least preferred food item and as the animal starts to satiate you then start working with more preferred food items at the end and so that way you can keep the animal engaged longer There's there's lots of ways to manipulate how the diet is offered that can create motivation for food. So here's an example with one of my own parrots that has a complete diet of pellets and fruits and vegetables available to her every day throughout the day but will eagerly work for a preferred food item which happens to be pine nuts and can eat a huge quantity of these pine nuts in a day if I made them available to her because they're just such a preferred food item. So another example is to train right before regular meal times. In this example, this is an aviary and the birds would have a diet with them throughout the entire day and right before closing the diet was removed to prevent pests from entering the aviary. So first thing in the morning before they were given their regular diet, they were very motivated to participate in a training session and preferred food items were used during that training session. In this example, storks were fed until they were satiated several times a day. So we would uh, go in, have a training session, offer fish for the participating in training, and we would keep working with them until they basically slowed down and showed less interest in eating. And then we would come back and do it again. And again, these were animals who their weights never really changed during the whole process of training and using this strategy. I also recommend people consider using a variety of reinforcers, not just focusing on food reinforcers. Especially when it comes to parrots, we have many other reinforcers that have value to them. And here's an example of a head scratch yeah, being used right. as she a reinforcer to train this parrot. Puts her head right down. Right. Good. There you go, keep it going. Go all the way to the front. There you go. Food management is one strategy that we can use. Including more types of reinforcers is another strategy we can use to address uh, moving away from weight management and still having an animal motivated. But another strategy that's often overlooked is schedules of reinforcement. So there's lots of different schedules of reinforcement. What most bird shows tend to do is reinforce every presentation of a single behavior. So a fixed ratio one schedule. But there's so many different schedules and they can make behaviors really super resistant to extinction. And so this will allow you to get more motivation from an animal without having to make it more hungry or more concerned about food. And in bird shows, it's very predictable. We usually get the same behavior the same behavior pattern over and over again and often the same reinforcer at the very end. So it's pretty easy to see where behavior could easily break down if the animal wasn't pretty motivated for food in those situations. So here's an example from the Knoxville Zoo of a very famous parrot they have named Einstein. Then you'll see that she'll do quite a few behaviors before she gets fed. So this is just an example of using different schedules of reinforcement. I'm going to let her introduce herself to everybody. Can you tell everybody your name? Einstein. This is Einstein. Can you tell everyone hi? Hello. That's nice. Can you be polite? Yes, sweetheart. Much better. She especially likes his latest achievement, Spaceship One. Einstein, would you like to ride in Bert's spaceship? Even if it doesn't have a laser? Yeah. 
before we wrap it up, she would like to give a shout out to all her animal friends back at the Knoxville Zoo. Einstein, do you want to say hi to all the owls? <laughs> what about the other birds? <whistles> the penguin? <whistles> there we go. <laughs> Let's get that one out of there. How about a chimpanzee? <whistles> Very good. <laughs> what about a wolf? <whistles> and a pig? <whistles> And the rooster. <laughs> and how about those cats? <laughs> at, at the zoo, we have big cats from the jungle. <laughs> what about a skunk? <laughs> uh, she's, she's a comedian. <laughs> I suppose you think you're famous. Are you famous? Superstar. Yeah, you are. Stars. Here's another example that was presented at a conference by Jackie Kozlowski of Tri-State Bird Rescue. In this example, they're actually working with birds in a rehabilitation situation, so it isn't a show situation, but that what they need from the birds is more exercise, more performance of behavior in order to get them more physically fit for, for preparing for release. So what they worked up to was many different flights back and forth between these perches before the bird would be delivered a mouse through the PVC pipe. And uh, I believe they got up to 32 flights back and forth just by focusing on gradually working in schedules of reinforcement that are more than an FR1 in their training process. So again, it's a great strategy for building duration and building behaviors resistant to extinction, and one that we don't take advantage of enough in the bird show world. The marine mammal community is really good at using these strategies. In fact, they do a whole bunch of things that we could really learn from, that we could apply to our bird shows that would help us not rely so much on weight management. And one thing they do is they might generalize behaviors a little bit more than we do. Instead of this bird does the same exact pattern behavior over here every single time, it might be you do that behavior in this space and sometimes in this space and sometimes in that space. Another thing they do that I love is that it isn't always the same behavior over and over again in the same pattern. So a lot of times you'll see a show where Harris Hawk does the same routine every show, same set of A to B, so very predictable. Whereas a marine mammal show may have an animal that knows 20 different behaviors. It doesn't know which behavior it's going to be asked. Maybe it's going to have to do three or four behaviors before a reinforcer is delivered. And it doesn't know what that reinforcer is going to be. So all those things make it much more interesting for the animal. They make it more likely the animal is going to be engaged. And they also keep the animal more motivated to present the behavior and doesn't rely on the animal just having to be hungry for food in order to get those behaviors. So to me, it makes sense that if you've got a bird that only knows one behavior pattern, it's always the same, and it's always going to get a predictable reinforcer at the end. If that bird gets spooked off for any reason, it ends up flying out of its pattern behavior and sits up in a tree, totally makes sense to me that that bird wouldn't come down right away. It's because everything's predictable. But if that behavior was much more generalized, if the bird knew to fly from any perch anywhere when you cued it, then it very likely would come down. But so basically, I think a lot of times what happens when these birds fly off that are in these very predictable situations, people jump to the conclusion that the animal's not hungry enough. And that's because they've been, you know, working it so fat, and that's why it's not responding. When in reality, to me, it's just not trained to the level it should be so that you don't have to rely on weight management. So yes, it does mean a little bit more work on our part. But again, to going back to the, the whole point of this is we're really looking at animal welfare. And I think it's worth it to us to take the time to train animals to, to be at that kind of level of training. Obviously, you just don't jump from an FR1 schedule to you know, something a little bit more unpredictable. You would have to gradually work up to that. But I think in the long run, it's worth it for that animal's welfare. Here's some examples of birds that are trained without weight management. And this first example, this is actually wild birds. These are uh, pigeons in New York City that um, come to this park every day because there's a person who will feed them every day. Now these birds do get food elsewhere, but they also know this person and this person knows individuals come to feed every day. And what they'll work for is preferred food items. So here's some examples of training wild birds that have access to whatever food they want but are just happy to come for the easy free meal. Oh, that was a good one. I'm going to work on my feet. So, the veterinary care. Okay. Yeah, that was a good one. So you train all animals. I do. 
There we go. Yay! <laughs> Targeting is just asking an animal to orient a body part towards something. In this case, we're asking this pigeon to target its beak towards the star. It is. It's his own little, his own little amusement park, isn't it? And he doesn't want anyone else on the ride. Did you notice? Keeps chasing everybody away. Yeah. <laughs> Says me and only me. There you go. That's a good one. Here's another example. This is a flock of scarlet macaws that I trained at Dallas World Aquarium. And these were young birds when they came to the facility, so there was no weight management going on. These birds needed to have access to a lot of food to, to grow and develop properly. But we did need to start training them. So what we started doing was having training sessions right before mealtime. And during training sessions, they worked for preferred food items. And then when they returned to their transport cage, we offered them the rest of their diet and that diet was also transferred into their aviary where they had access to it for a few hours and typically what would happen is the birds would eat until they were satiated and they would go roost while they were roosting the leftovers were taken out and then we would come back and do another training session and repeat the process over and over again so what was happening is the birds were eating as much food as they wanted after training sessions and it was left for them for quite a while we saw their weights continually increase because they were growing birds, but we still had great motivation for food reinforcers, and we didn't have to micromanage their weight or diet. And these birds were trained to do a big flocking flight behavior. This was a harpy eagle that we worked with at the Dallas Zoo, and this particular bird was an exhibit animal that we had done some training with. And again, her diet wasn't micromanaged in the beginning. We didn't even she wasn't trained to go on a scale, so um, that wasn't really a part of it. We did train her to go on a scale just to monitor her weight in general as a general health thing. I I didn't mention this in the beginning, but. I have no problem with people weighing animals just to have an idea of their health and their condition and their growth, but weighing an animal for health purposes is very, very different than weighing animals to figure out a weight range for motivation for food, a very different topic. So please don't misunderstand that, that weighing an animal is something I'm against. It certainly isn't. Weighing to monitor health is absolutely... 100% a good idea in my book, but weighing just to create motivation for food is a different topic altogether, which is what we're discussing here. So the harpy eagle, we weighed primarily to check on her health status, not to micromanage her weight or diet in order to train her. And we often use preferred food items, which in her case happened to be rabbit, and we're able to get quite a bit of behavior out of her without micromanaging the weight or the diet. In this facility in um, Austria, Kias and ravens are trained without weight management. And what I think is really fascinating about this is people often compare, oh, well, it's not free flight, it's a captive situation. But what's really interesting about research is often the behavioral demands on a research bird are much greater than those of a free flighted bird. Um, your free flighted bird may come out and do three or four flights and that's it. Whereas these kias and ravens may have to do hundreds of repetitions of a, a behavior in a day for experimental purposes. To me, I think it's really important to take note of what's been done at this facility in which their ravens and kias do have access to big portions of their diet throughout the day and they work primarily per, for preferred re, food reinforcers. Another thing that's important with the ravens is that part of their studies involve needing ravens to do normal behaviors when it comes to food, like caching behaviors. So having a decreased diet would actually impact their research in a way that they wouldn't like. So it's very important that they have access to a lot of food. Here's an example in a show setting. These are lorikeets that were trained to work for nectar at Turtle, Par uh, Turtle Bay Exploration Park. And you'll see that they'll do their flight to receive nectar at the end. At Dreamworld in Australia, it's a mast owl. They train to do behaviors in their shows, but they were having some issues when the animal was being heavily weight managed. And so they decided to focus more on behavioral responses, increase the diet, and what they got was exactly what they had hoped for, an animal that responds quite well and doesn't show the anxiety about food that it once did. Here are some parrots and cranes and hornbills at Avian Behavior International. This team also flies birds outside and does not use weight management as the primary means of creating motivation for their birds. Their birds do work for preferred food items and other types of reinforcers. 
What I also appreciate about this video is the fact that these birds may be out for longer periods of time than birds in a typical bird show setting that might be doing a quick behavior and then going back into their enclosure. This is a clip from a conservation project that I worked with in New Zealand called the Kakapo Recovery Program. Kakapo are flightless nocturnal parrots. There's only about 126 of them left in the world. And this particular individual had a problem of relentlessly trying to mate with people's heads. And what's really interesting about this particular individual and, and the others is that they roam freely on islands. So they have access to whatever food they want all the time. But Soraka was a hand-raised bird, so he does have a level of comfort around people. But he also is interested in the food items we have to offer because there's something that's not available in his environment. So we were able to train him using uh, pine nuts as food reinforcers, and also some bits of apple and a type of potato and kind of a pine cone that he doesn't always have available to him. And you'll also see in the video clip that we also use sex as a reinforcer. So again, to me, it speaks volume that this bird is free roaming, free ranging, has access to food all the time, but just by using preferred food reinforcers and, and the bird having a level of comfort with people, we were able to get behavior. In this example, we were working with a pair of king vultures that were in a breeding situation and we had initiated all of our training from outside the enclosure and these birds were not weight managed at all in fact we just used their normal diet to train them we trained them before breeding season and then during breeding season and then when they were uh, raising a chick their diet was actually doubled because they were feeding the chick and because they had a nice reinforcement history with us already even while they were feeding the chicks and received twice the diet that they normally would, see, would receive, they still came down and participated in training sessions with us. And eventually once the chick fledged, the chick learned to follow the parents and come down and participate in training sessions, even though it's a parent-raised chick. So for me, this is another nice example that there's so much that can be done without micromanaging the weight of the animal or the diet of the animal. In this last example, this facility is Cockatoo Downs in Oregon. And this is an example of free-flighted cockatoos at this facility owned by Chris Shank. These birds are able to fly around the property all day long. And while they are out, they eat fruit off of fruiting trees. They also eat grass shoots on the ground. They basically can forage all day long. Chris Shank, the person who runs this facility, is also an animal trainer and you'll see some of the props in the in the background there. The birds have a long history of training with those props, so those are conditioned reinforcers, and Chris offers preferred food items that she carries in her pocket. Some of these birds are actually parent raised, they're not um, they're not hand raised, and to me what's also very interesting about this is that they don't really have a pet-like relationship with Chris Shank. A lot of people think this is all about cuddling parrots, but the reality is what we see here is, is a great example of all the solutions that I mentioned. You know, this is, this is about giving birds lots of choices, giving birds access to a lot of food, but using the training strategies that we know well. So building up strong reinforcement histories, using preferred food reinforcers, using schedules of reinforcement, generalizing behaviors, and getting great performance of behaviors. At the end of the day, the birds fly back into their aviaries where the rest of their diet is typically waiting for them. But again, that diet is kind of not that important to them because they do have other things available to them throughout the day. So another great example of what's possible that we have yet to explore. So in conclusion, hopefully I gave you some things to think about when it comes to training birds. But I want to make sure that I make the emphasis that it's not about just putting animals on feed up or free feed. It's really about using all these tools that we have at our disposal to create motivation so that we don't have to rely on micromanaging diets and weights. So it's not really about abolishing motivation to participate in training. We still want motivation. We just have to be thoughtful and ethical about how we create that motivation. There are so many ways to influence motivation without the use of excessive hunger or perceived food shortages. So I really hope you will 
think long and hard about some of these things that were mentioned here. I also hope that you'll read the paper because the paper goes into a lot more detail. If you look in the text under this video, you'll see a direct link to that paper. Please read it. Please share it. Please share this video. I really think it's time for us to take a closer look at some of the strategies that we're using and it's time for us to stop putting so much weight on the scale and think about all those other tools in our toolbox that we can use to create motivation in birds and training and help make sure we're giving the best we can to them and really attending to their welfare. So thanks again for listening to this paper and I hope it gives you some food for thought.